Welcome dear participants. In the previous module, we have discussed the theoretical beginnings of the post-colonial theory. In today's module, we would start a discussion about the key concepts and would also incorporate the major contributions of certain theorists. The key concepts are here. The first concept which I would discuss is the concept of othering. The concept of othering is based on binary opposition which we have discussed in detail during our discussions on postmodernism. As Said has talked about the concept of othering in his book on orientalism, this is an issue of racial othering. The binary based on racial hierarchies, the white and the black, the west and the east, the European and the non-European always providing a place of privilege to the west. So, based on the white supremacist uh, discourse, the colonized others are seen as heathen, savages, intellectually inferior who have to be saved somehow. So, colonies are seen as being devoid of rationality, culture and society and the ideology of white men's burden was used to justify colonial exploitation, domination and expansion also. This poem by Rudyard Kipling on the white men's burden brings up this idea very clearly when he says that a particular colonized person is like a half devil and half child who has to take up the white men's burden in patience to abide, to veil the threat of terror and check the show of pride. The sorrow and trauma of a colonized person has been very succinctly presented in this poem by Rudyard Kipling. The literature of the colonizers has traditionally infantilized the colonized and presented them as either exotic or demonic characters. We can take the example from Shakespeare's play The Tempest where the Prospero and Caliban controversy is one of the best examples of it. Whereas, Caliban has been presented simultaneously as an exotic as well as a demonic character. The similar has been the portrayal of the natives in the Heart of Darkness by Conrad and the character of Friday in Robinson Crusoe. Edward Said in his treatise has taken up Foucault's discourse analysis to explore the power knowledge dynamics in the production and dissemination of oriental stereotypes. The oriental stereotypes are based on how the West perceives the Eastern people to be. According to them in their own assumptions and stereotypes, the Orient is timeless, it is exotic, it is morally and sexually lax, it is irrational, it is heathen and therefore it has to be saved and saving them is the burden of the white men. So, we find that this concept of othering ultimately is also interlinked with other key concepts of the post-colonial ideology. Another aspect which is very important to understand for us is the idea of diaspora. Diasporic studies are also an independent field of study, but as a part of post-colonial theories, their implications have to be understood. The term diaspora etymologically has been taken from a Greek word diasperio which means scattering, dispersion and this very word brings up a very keen and sharp kinesic image before us that of a villager is scattering the seeds in order to plant them. It refers to the displacement of the people, dispersion of the people from their homelands. Historically, the earliest use of the term is found in the Bible where it refers to the Jews dispersion recorded in the Old Testament. Later on we find that during the colonial rule, it was the indenture labor and the transatlantic slave trade which resulted in the mass, mass and forced diasporic migration of people. The widespread migration in the second half of the 20th century was also a result of globalization and the aftermath of the colonial rule, sometimes in search of a better education, sometimes in search of a better life, sometimes to escape the poverty created by the colonized rule. Critics define a diasporic population as one that gets displaced voluntarily or involuntarily 
from their native lands, their countries and are united by their collective memory of the myths and cultures and the language of the homeland. The Oxford English Dictionary shows that the first recorded usage of the word diaspora in English was in 1876, where it referred to the extensive diaspora work of evangelizing. The term became widely assimilated by the 1950s with long term expatriates in significant numbers moving from one country to other and also erstwhile colonies came to be referred to as people of diasporic origin. An academic field diaspora studies has become established relating to this sense of the word. If we have to understand the characteristics of diaspora, we have to refer to critics like William Sarfan and others. Diasporic people share a desire to return to the homeland and this desire is often characterized by a nostalgic memory of the homeland. The mythicization of the homeland as a desirable place sometimes remains a utopia only and it is also possible that they do not actually move back to their own country of origin. But this type of a desire, a utopia that the homeland is the desirable place always exercises as a pull. So, this imaginary home is a place of no return in fact, a place within the diasporic imagination as several literary critics have also shown in their creative and critical works. Even physical return to the homeland is not a return to the place of origin as a diasporic identity is constituted as a product of the influences of the host culture and the native culture or the home culture. In the context of Indian diaspora, we find that the historical roots of diasporic population go back to several centuries. Even in the pre-historical times or rather those times about the history of which we do not have very clear records, we find that the diasporic movement had taken place. The Buddhist monks had travelled to various other countries, various kingdoms particularly in the south had relationships, marital and military relationships with various other countries. However, we find that the recorded and documented diasporic movement of Indian people begins as early as the 11th century when there was a large scale exportation of Indian slaves to the Central Asia. Unlike the transatlantic slave trade, the trade of Indian slaves is not very keenly documented, but still there are enough historical documents to support this claim. So, India has been a main supplier of slaves till 17th century. This policy of exporting Indian slaves to the Central Asia was followed by the Turks, by the Afghans and also by the earlier Mughal rules, rulers of India. It was only during the reign of Shah Jaha that there was an official attempt to stop the export of Indian slaves and gradually we find that it pittered out towards the last days of the Mughal era. During the British, British time we find that the land settlement and oppressive revenue collection had made peasants lose their lands to landlords and it resulted into another practice which was called as indentured labour. We find that in the international scenario, the movement of Indian diaspora, the movement of Indian slaves and labourers was also marked by the fact that the slavery as a custom was officially abolished in 1843 and there was a need of supply of cheap labour on plantations in other British colonies like Mauritius, Guiana, the West Indies and Fiji as well as in other European colonies including uh, colonies in West Africa, Peru and Cuba. So, Indian labour substituted the newly liberated African slaves in these countries and the British empire started the tradition or the custom of contract labour or the wage labour. So, as an outcome we find that hordes and hordes of Indian people were sent forcibly or sometimes they were lured and entrapped to take up these type of contracts either by the circumstances because they were so poor. Now, uh, the system of contract and wage labour was introduced by the British government 
and sometimes people were sent forcibly and sometimes they were entrapped because they had lost their land and they were poor. So, we find that the diasporic movement is uh, very well recorded and we can trace the diasporic movement of states from Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh to Burma, Malaysia and Sri Lanka. From Bihar and Uttar Pradesh, we find that the diasporic movement had been to 15 uh, British, uh, French and Dutch colonies primarily. And from Punjab, we find that the Sikhs and Muslims went to East Africa, what is known as Uganda now. So, we find that the endangered labor, this custom which was started after the abolition of slavery in America continued till 1917 and it was only when the world was started then the system was finished because the empire at that time needed Indian soldiers and not the Indian slaves. So, we find that all these actions were taken up by the colonized powers in order to serve their own interest and the interest of the colonized people were never taken into for granted. When under the post-colonial theory, there is an attempt to rewrite the history to understand the exploitation of the colonized people, we find that there is a tendency to talk about these aspects of uh, cultural memories. Among the main theorists, we find that along with Fainan, Edward Said, Spivak, there are also uh, writers like Baba, Vijay Mishra and Stuart Hall who have contributed mainly to our understandings of post-colonial theory. There are several literary writers also whom we can uh, list over here, particularly I would say Naipaul, Bharti Mukherjee, Meena Alexander, Kiran Desai, Jhumpa Lahiri, Chitra Divakaruni, etc. When we talk about the key concepts, another key concept is double consciousness. This concept has been formulated by W. E. B. Du Bois and the concept of double consciousness resonates with the ideas of Franz Fanon when he had talked about the divided self or the fragmented self. Fanon has talked about the consequences of identity formation by a colonized person. He had said that a colonized person because of an ingrained shame in his personality, his traumatic experiences of inferiority and similar complexes tries to learn the values of the colonizers and he tries to understand their language, their cultures, their, their values, their way of life. But ultimately, it remains like a mask which covers the uncivilized nature which is indexed by the black skin of the people. Fanon has said that a man is expected to behave like a man, but he was expected to behave like a black man. So, the equality is never accepted in our behavior be between the colonized, colonizer and the colonized people. This idea has been presented for the first time, documented very well by Franz Fanon in his book Black Skin White Mask, published in 1952 a dying colonialism in 1959 and the wretched of the earth in 1961. So, we find that Fanon had started this idea of double consciousness. Dubo has described double consciousness as two souls, two thoughts in one dark body, which later on Mina Alexander altered as many souls, many thoughts in one dark body, pointing out the fact that a migrant's experience is multiple and the subject positions are also multiple. So, when these writers talk about the psychological effects of colonialism on the colonized, the objectification of a person simply on the basis of one's skin color, which leads to an identity crisis among the dark skinned colonized people, then Mina Alexander and Dupo have talked about two souls and many souls. So, these ideas ultimately formulate the basis of various themes in the writings of post-colonial writers like Naipaul, Rashti, Amitav Ghosh, Walcott and others. Another major term which is used in post-colonial theory is the subaltern. The word was introduced by Ramsey to refer to the working class. The lexical meaning of subaltern is of a person who belongs to a lower status or a low ranking military official. 
This term was popularized later on by Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak in her 1985 essay, Can the Subaltern Speak? Her essay was a critique of the work of those theorists who constituted the subaltern studies group, namely Ranjit Guha, Deepesh Chakravarti and Shahid Amin among others. She has criticized the extensive use of European theorized, theorists like Foucault, Deleuze and Guattari in formulations on post-colonial issues and wonders about the authenticity of the subaltern speech, the ways in which subaltern resistance and, and protest can be appropriated by various discourses. She also thinks that the subaltern talk does not achieve the dialogic level of utterance because the act of speech is not completed till it is heard. So she asks the question further, who speaks for the subaltern? Spivak insists that the word subaltern is not just a classy word for the oppressed, for other, for somebody who is not getting quote unquote the piece of pie. She points out that in Gramsci's original covert usage, it signified proletarian. And we have to remember that Gramsci was sending his writings out of the prison. So he used to encrypt his own writings so that they could pass through the boundaries of the jail. So in his original writings, as Spivak has correctly pointed out, the use of the uh, word subaltern has been there for the proletarian. A person whose voice could not be heard, who is being structurally written out of the capitalist bourgeois narrative. In post-colonial terms, as she says in her interview with de Kock, everything that has limited or no access to the cultural imperialism is subaltern. It is a space of difference. Now who would say that is just the oppressed, the working class is oppressed, it is not subaltern. So she has clearly differentiated between the subaltern and the working class. Another concept which we have to understand in the context of post-colonial theory is history. Colonizers contempt towards the intellectual traditions of occupied countries is well established and therefore the post-colonial writers felt that they have to rewrite the history. This idea was supported by the postmodernist idea that the history cannot be a single one and that there would always be plural voices. Fenon has written in his Wretched of the Earth, colonialism is not satisfied merely with holding a people in its grip and emptying the native's brain of all form and content. By a kind of perverted logic, it turns to the past of oppressed people and distorts, disfigures and destroys it. Fenon's idea is so true that we can find that similar indications are present in various writings of British colonial officers from time to time. One particular incident which I would quote over here is from Macaulay's infamous minutes of 2nd February 1835. Though there is a continuous debate going on as to the place where he had actually delivered it, was it delivered in Calcutta or was it delivered in London? But the records of the minutes dated 2nd February 1835 are available in a documented shape. And I quote, it is I believe no exaggeration to say that all the historical information which has been collected from all the books written in the Sanskrit language is less valuable than what may be found in the most paltry abridgments used at preparatory schools in England. So the manner in which the intellectual tradition of a whole culture has been rubbished in a contemptuous manner by a colonizer is manifest in Macaulay's writings. And it has been universally present in other countries and in other colonial contexts. So we find that the western countries, the European powers, the white supremacy in fact believed in their own normativity. And therefore, they termed that the colonized people, the colony under them is barbaric and uncivilized and they wanted a reconstruction of the people. In the same manner, we find that the post-colonial theorists want a reconstruction of history and the colonized intellectuals have started to rewrite the history in order to understand their own legacy in a better manner. 
So, post colonial writers and theorists interrogate and destabilize the truth value of dominant and hegemonic forms of history and historiography. They map the history of decolonization, the diversity and complexity of perspectives and methods of resistance, and in attempt to rewrite, reconfigure colonial history by writing alternative and parallel narratives that challenge the perspectives of the colonial powers. According to Nasrullah Membrol, the post-colonial preoccupation with history addresses issues such as interrogating the effects of colonialism in terms of cultural alienation, the anti-colonial struggles of the third world and the rise of nationalism in different countries which were erstwhile colonies, the creation of mimic men in colonial culture, the appropriation of history by the colonial master, attempts to retrieve and rewrite their own histories by the formerly colonized cultures and different modes of representation of truth as is understood by the colonized people. So, we find that the process of retrieval of history for a post colonial culture invariably includes an intense awareness that native history without colonial contamination is not possible. The subaltern study project seeks to discover beneath the layers of colonial historiography the local resistance to colonialism. In a way, we can say that it is a history from below, utilizing resources in native languages and non-colonial forms of history recording such as folk songs, ballads, letters, memoirs, etcetera. It has also given rise to anti-colonial writing or let us say cultural nationalist writing, which has also given rise to negritude movement, African aesthetic, etcetera. Another idea which is important to understand in the context of post-colonial theory is the idea of race as a socially constructed category. I would like to quote Howard Winant, who in his essay Race and Race Theory published in 2000 gives an overview of the origins of the concept of race and takes us through the development of sociological theories in this context from its 19th century positions which had emphasized on biologism to the contemporary theories of socio-historical interpretations. <laughs> he says that the racial categorization is basically a European invention and it is also intimately connected with the beginnings of modernity and the creation of modern political period. And as we have discussed earlier, the nexus of economy and political supremacy have always had a place in the, in the establishment of the colony. So, the dawn of the seaborne empire, the conquest of the Americas, the global economic integration, the rise of the Atlantic slave trade, etcetera, were all connected elements in the genealogy of race and this aspect has also been posited by Winant in his essay. Antonia Darter in her essay suggests that the notions of race are a primary, primarily ideological construction of racism or a racialized interpretation of phenotypically and regionally different human beings. People who are differentiated on the basis of phenotypical features are also represented collectively as they possess certain cultural characteristics with the result that the population is represented as exhibiting a specific profile of biological and cultural attributes and the concept of differences has been abolished in this understanding. The deterministic manner of this representation means that all those who possess a signified phenotypical characteristics are assumed to possess the additional characteristics. So, we find that this particular idea of race incorporates a basic understanding that the racial features are common not only in terms of biology or skin colors, but also in terms of cultural attributes. So, critical race studies, ethnicity studies and specific traditions in literature and philosophy etcetera have suggested how this issue of race has occupied a central place in the development of different movements and how it is important for us to understand the post-colonial theories. The issue of gender as we have discussed in detail earlier also 
In the context of post-colonial theory talks about the double operation of women under colonialism, imperialism and patriarchy. So, critical writings pays a special attention to the role of gender and sexuality and the experiences of men and women of color or men of women of different race, races which have been subjugated under the colonial empowerment. So, post-colonial gender studies examine how class, caste, economy, political empowerment and literacy have contributed to the condi condition of women in the post-colonial countries. And this aspect we have discussed in detail in the context of um, our discussions of writers like Audre Lorde and Patricia Collins as well as Ellis Walker. And now we come to a discussion of major theorists of post-colonial studies. So, these have been the prominent words with which we have to be familiar when we start talking further about the post-colonial theories. Now, as far as the theorists of post-colonial study are concerned, we would particularly focus on Edward Said, Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak and Homi Bhava. So, Edward Said has been associated with the beginnings of post-colonial theory with the publication of his book Orientalism in 1978 in which he has given an account of the cultural representation of the Orient. Major discussions of Edward Said along with the discussions on Spivak and Bhava will be taken over further in the next module. Thank you.